Bernadine Evaristo, welcome to 7.30. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, you say in this new book, um, Manifesto on Never Giving Up, that if you were to give one book to your younger self, it would be your Booker Prize winning book, Girl, Woman, Other. Why choose that book for her? Yeah, because when I was coming of age in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there really was no literature about black British women. I mean, maybe one or two books. It was like a, a desert. And this is a book that opens up the possibilities of who we are in society from the age of 19 to mm. the age, somebody in her 90s. So I think I would have been really inspired by it, actually. Uh, why not give her this book, which would actually, or at least a peek into it, that would tell her that it all ends up well? And I'd give her this book as well, Manifesto. Right. <laughs> so she gets both. Yes, yes. Now, you talk about that period that there were... that those characters did not exist in British literature or hardly at all in British mm. literature at the time. Who do you, whose fault was that? Was that the publishing world or was it the reader's lack of curiosity? What, what was, why was that? Well, you know, when I was coming of age, it's understandable because my generation was called the second generation. And usually one or both of our parents had come over from Africa or Asia or the Caribbean and they were establishing themselves in Britain. They didn't have time to write books. Mm. There were some writers, but not many. My generation was born in Britain and we were much more established in, in the country and we were able, I think. We had the opportunities to write books. So that's what it was like 40 years ago. But then fast forward, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I think it was the fault of the publishing industry mm. because they just didn't have the imagination to think that people would want to read books about black British people or black British women's lives. Um, and the readers, as a result, weren't being introduced to that literature. Now, that's what I want to ask you about, because the thing that's so amazing about the way you you came to write about your grandmother is that amazing to me as an outsider to you and your experience is that she's she's well being kind she also said things like your mother had sullied the bloodline how did you get over the shocking hateful things that she said to write such a nuanced character. So my grandmother was born at the turn of the 20th century into a working class background of part Irish heritage. She wanted my mother, her only child, to do well in society. My mother came home in her late, tw early 20s and said she's gonna marry a black man uh, who was not a prince, he was a welder, he was working in a factory. It was the worst thing that could happen to my grandmother. So writing her story from her perspective um, allowed me to understand why she was racist. A, she was of a generation where racism was much more part of society, it wasn't really challenged. And B, her only child, the person she put all her dreams into, came home and married a black man and then had eight black children in 10 years, right? Which was just <laughs> terrible for my grandmother. So it's about understanding where people come from. As a novelist, I try to understand the psychology of my characters. That's what really interests me. Mm. And to try to present them in as complex a way as possible without judging them. So yes, my grandmother was racist, but I do create an empathetic portrayal of her and Lara. You talk about appropriation, you, you deal with the critique head on, because you, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that you have artistic freedom, that you should be able to go where that artistic freedom takes you. You're, you say you're joyful and you're a, a, a rules breaker. At the same time, the publishing industry has been um, weighted against black writers for hundreds and hundreds of years. Is there, is there an argument then in this era to keep mainstream writers away from certain subjects, just to redress the balance for a while, just in this period? It's it's really difficult answer for that question because on the one hand, people should be free to write whatever they like, right? I believe in artistic freedom. Um, but they also have to consider that they might be writing about communities that they don't fully understand. So on the one hand, there's artistic freedom, which I think people should have, but there may be feedback. <laughs> there may be feedback, right? But when we talk about film and, and television drama, usually people don't even know who's written it. Mm. And often it's very multiracial, right? And it's if you take the idea of people not being able to write outside of their own demographic to its logical conclusion, 
then if you have a film with black and white and Asian characters, for example, then you should say, well, you should have a white writer writing the white characters and a black writer writing the black writer, mm. the black characters and an um, Asian writer. That, that's ridiculous, right? Mm. So I think we have to, it's something we, we have to work with. I want to come back to the idea of feedback because you said, you know, if you write something that is clearly from somebody else's culture, there will be feedback. Now, sometimes that feedback is very tough, very harsh. When you were a young person, you were a, a rock thrower. You would go to plays and... Metaphorically speaking. <laughs> yes. You say, about, you say about yourself, the person I am today no longer throws stones at the fortress, but we still need those rabid wolves out there, is what you said. Um, but there is a difference, isn't there? Because when it comes to social media, it can be a pylon. Is that, is that not just too dangerous? It's it's so it's such an interesting and I think slightly dangerous time to be honest, um, because I kind of believe in I believe in social media and it's very powerful and positive in many many ways, but there is also a really toxic side of it. I know that as a young person who was a feminist and you know kind of very coming into my black identity, I had a lot to say, but that was said to the people around me. Nobody else heard me, you know, mm. I, I didn't have access to the media in any way. It was just said to my little circle and any stupid things that I said, nobody was going to remember that, it was not recorded. Now people have very knee-jerk responses and have actually, they're being, they're being nurtured through the platform of Twitter in particular to have, to be outraged mm. at a lot of things. And when a lot of people are outraged about at particular things, there's critical mass. And, you know, there is a kind of sense of mob rule. Um, what I find problematic about Twitter is that we're not having conversations. Mm. People are expressing their opinions. It is not a conversation. Where are those conversations happening? And it's so polarizing, as we're all saying, it's so polarizing. But I don't know where we go with it because it's ultimately damaging, I think, to people who have progressive views sometimes. Coming back to your career, I mean, the... This is manifesto on never giving up. And you say you tell your students never to take no for an answer. Now, you did an amazing thing, which is that you use posit positive affirmation to help you stay the course. Just tell me how that worked. For example, I know that you wrote down that you were going to win the Booker a long I time did. before you wrote it. How do you change the cast of your mind? In my 30s, I decided, I think I was already a strong person. I already had a lot to say. I'd already created this theatre company. I was already writing. But I decided to focus on being positive and to focus on being ambitious and to focus on getting the most out of my life um, that I could, as well as my community, because I'm also an activist. So I started to rewire my brain. And I'm not saying it's completely rewired, because it's not, um, but to expect the best, to have big visions, to think positive about everything, you know, to not give in to be, the feelings of being a victim, to not feel crushed and, and conquered. And, um, and that has kept me going through the years. And I've seen people fall by the wayside in the arts, you know, because they give up. For me, giving up was, was not an option because I was doing what I wanted to do, which was to write books and to be somebody in the literature world. And the, 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 the way in which I kept going was through positive thinking, manifestation, using the tools. A lot of them came from America of personal self-development and, and achievement. Bernadine Everisto, the joy is ours. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.